Hi everyone, uh, my name is Vasudev Rao and I am from Division of AIDS Research at NIMH. Uh, and this session uh, is a sponsor session from both NIMH and OAR and uh, we would like to thank OAR for their generous support. Uh, also, we would like to thank the organizers as well as the chairs for allowing us to have this session. Uh, if the speakers can give a brief introduction. Sure, good afternoon. My name is Tracy Wilson. I'm from the State University of New York, Downstate Medical Health Sciences University in Brooklyn, New York. Hi, Ron Ellis, UC San Diego in Neurology. And uh, Brian Pence, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Department of Epidemiology. And can you hear me? Uh, Bo Ansis, uh, Department of Neurology, Washington University in St. Louis. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, thank you folks. Uh, and I'll introduce our uh, newly minted Deputy Director for Division of AIDS Research, Gregory Green Greenwood. Over to you, Greg. Hey. All right, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, have our first slide, please. Great, so as, um, thank you, oh, thank you. So um, really a shout out to Vasu Rao, who's really kind of the, the um, brains behind all of this for putting this all together and to uh, Office of AIDS Research, NIHOAR. Um, as you know, NIHOAR um, uh, priorities are around the four pillars of reduction, treatment, cure, and comorbidities with cross-cutting priorities. Oops. And the Division of AIDS Research at NIMH, um, you'll see that we support um, those OAR priorities from reductions, therapeutics, cure, uh, comorbidities. Um, so we support research looking at to reduce the incidence of HIV worldwide, decrease the burden of uh, those living with HIV. And our Division of AIDS Research supports uh, research at the basic clinic, clinical neuroscience level, understanding and alleviating the consequences of HIV on the CNS and basic and applied behavioral social science around preventing HIV transmission and limit, limiting morbidity, mortality among those living with HIV. So the kind of th three areas, behavioral science, clinical neuroscience, and basic neuroscience. We, uh, in terms of topic areas at the Division of Age Research, we really range from cell to society. So at the cell level, you know, some of the research we support is around neuropathogenesis, neuroimaging, genetics, uh, cure, therapeutics, for example. At the individual level, uh, mental health, neurocognition, adherence, ret uh, retention, testing. Interpersonal level, maternal child, couples, interpersonal partner violence, community and healthcare system levels, as well as societal, such as intersectional stigma discrimination, policy, social determinants of health. And our data science portfolio really um, uh, uh, ranges um, all, those all those levels. And at the NIMH Division of Age Research, you know, you'll see this nice word cloud of some of those topic areas. Um, but just to give you an example of some of the research that we support, um, so, for example, developing and testing strategies to increase HIV testing, to support linkage to prevention or treatment. Um, we have a strong implementation science portfolio around looking to enhance dissemination of evidence-based, um, both biomedical and behavioral, um, for um, uh, maximum impact. And on the neuro-HIV uh, area, studying the pathophysiologic mechanisms of HIV-induced CNS dysfunction, developing novel therapeutic approaches um, to mitigate CNS complications, and characterizing HIV persistence in the CNS in the context of ART um, and translation research around eradication of HIV from the brain. <clears throat> 
We've been involved with uh, aging and HIV for quite a while. Um, starting in 1998, the National NeuroAIDS Tissue Consortium, uh, the charter uh, cohort um, was established in 2002. You'll see several RFAs that our division has supported, um, focusing around HIV and aging. Um, we started supporting the Max and Wise in 2014, so we were a little late to um, join the ICO sponsors of Max and Wise, um, but a proud sponsor since uh, 2014. And then you'll see some recent uh, program announcements or RFAs in the last couple of years. And I think uh, many of you know the current RFA that Vasu's leading the biotypes of CNS complications and people living with HIV. And so as we think about some of our priorities around HIV, you know, moving forward, um, you know, this isn't, ex this isn't exhaustive. Um, it's including, um, but not limited to, um, investigating the M uh, HIV impact on con cognition, motor function, and mental health, and aging adults so we can uh, comprehend mechanistic pathways and identify potential intervention targets. Um, study physiological and biobehavioral etiopathogenesis rele relevant to cognitive, motor, and mental health outcomes and explore how HIV status and viral load affect accelerated aging, neurocognitive aging, and also to pay attention to successful aging. Um, identify neurotherapeutic approaches addressing interactions between HIV and the aging process. And then on the behavioral social science side, looking at the effects of social behavioral factors on mental health and HIV outcomes among people aging with HIV, as well as assessing the impact of neurological and psychiatric comorbidities on outcomes. And finally, research interventions um, to address um, prevention of HIV in um, those aging populations and exploring adaptations um, to HIV care continuum. And so with that, um, both Vasu and I thank you, and I will let Vasu or we can turn to the next speaker. Next speaker, yeah, we'll have questions at the end. Great, thank you. Okay, um, my name's Bo Ansis, and it's really a pleasure to be here, and I wanna thank the organizers, as well as I wanna thank everybody here, and then those that are online for being here today. I'm gonna to be talking about CNS complications of people with HIV, I have no disclosures. So as you were hearing from Dr. Greenwood, it was really nice, beautiful summary. What this kind of next series of talks is really is to look at that bridging the gaps between biology, clinical care, and social dynamics. And so as a neurologist in the clinic, when I'm seeing patients in front of me, I'm thinking of these kinds of different factors, and I'll show you, and I apologize, it's primarily work that we've been doing, but there's a lot of work that a number of people here on the stage, as well as in the audience, have also been doing, and looking at these different topics. So one is time or legacy, so acute infection or chronic infection, I'll be primarily talking about more chronic infection, but I will show you a couple of slides on acute infection. We'll talk about the virus, so if it's well controlled or not in an individual, so when he or she's in front of me, I'm thinking about those factors. We'll talk about comorbidities, which have already been discussed earlier today. And then we'll also talk about social determinants of health. And you heard a little bit of mentions of that, and we've been really studying that, and there's even some posters out here about looking at that. And then finally, we now have an aging uh, society, and specifically, a lot of our patients are getting older with the disease, and so the question is uh, Alzheimer's disease, and then we'll be looking at medications and polypharmacy. So, for you, as a neurologist, time equals brain to me. And it, it, even though it's not maybe applicable to strokes, but that's also for early initiation of uh, antiretrovirals. So you see on the left-hand side a radar plot, and you can see an acute and earlier primary HIV infection. You see those areas that are outside of those ranges, meaning that there is enlargement of the ventricles and loss of the putamen. And then you can see on the right-hand side those areas in blue. That's showing you that before CART, those are antiretroviral therapy, those areas are affected, and then starting on antiretroviral therapy can actually lead to more of a normalization, so those areas in yellow and red uh, when individuals are started. And then if they are started earlier, it really makes a difference. So again, time equals brain. 
Also, the virus, it's pretty there and it's pretty important. So virological failure is associated with worse cognitive impairment. Sarah Cooley, Dr. Cooley is in the audience and she did some great work here and you can see neuropsychological uh, performance in those individuals with VF, virological failure. They are scoring significantly worse than those individuals that are virologically stable or VS. And then you can see those same effects as, as well in brain volumes to the point of, again, virological failure significantly reduced in those individuals compared to controls or uh, those who are virologically stable. What we also do, and we do this and we think about this, and I give the examples of either any of our presidents, including Barack Obama, or you think of Paul Rudd, and the idea is what do we look both chronologically as well as biologically? And so the idea is what does your chronological age versus your biological age? And you can see that there's offshoots of some of that where individuals are older than their stated age. And we can do those same kinds of tricks and look at this thing called BAG, brain age gap in neuroimaging. And if you're above that line, you have elevated brain age, aging. If you're below that line, you're more resilient, a.k.a. Paul Rudd. Um, so the ideas are we can start to differentiate individuals with this. Uh, Kaylin Peterson, who was here last year and presented on some of this great work, we looked at some of these variables, including cardiovascular risk as or cardiovascular disease, as well as co-infections. And you can see in the red line in individuals with HIV, they're higher and that their brain age gap is older than their stated age. And at the same time, also co-infections, so hepatitis C and in a lot of work that Dr. Latender is doing, has also shown that that also may lead to brain aging within individuals. Michelle Glantz, who was an undergrad, and so we love having those undergrad students doing these kinds of work. You can see the effects of cardiovascular risk. We also looked at that in relation to blood flow as well as cognitive impairment. And what you can see is, is that really these cardiovascular risk factors, we can capture them in neuroimaging. Sometimes they're actually not captured as well as in those neuropsych measures. And so, Yes, there's an effect of HIV, but there's also these other comorbidities that we be need, need to be thinking about, and that's why additional tests, not just cognitive testing, but also imaging can be very important. And it is also your lived experience. And so in, the, in St. Louis, we have something called the Del Mar Divide. We can use that, and it's really a sad case for redlining that's happened in the United States, and specifically in St. Louis. We can look at something called the Area Deprivation Index. And so uh, a low Area Deprivation Index is the least disadvantaged to those areas that are most highly disadvantaged, and you can see in red. When we've done that in HIV positive individuals as well as HIV negative individuals, as you can see on the right, that's been work that Dr. Wish has shown, it is affecting your brain. So living in certain areas has about a two-year effect on the brain, irregardless of your HIV status. And so really this lived or exposome is very, very important for individuals. Caitlin's also looked at aging in these individuals, and you can see here that those that are virologically poorly controlled, those individuals have an accelerated aging, and you can see on the right-hand side these blood flow measurements, they're also diminished. So older individuals who are poorly controlled, there's that kind of combination or acceleration of aging that's seen. Sarah Cooley has also been looking at these kinds of effects with Alzheimer's disease, and you can see in Alzheimer's disease we have four different groups, HIV-positive individuals uh, without dementia or with dementia, HIV-negative individuals without dementia or with dementia, aka Alzheimer's disease. You can see there's significant deposition in individuals with Alzheimer's disease using a PET imaging biomarker called uh, PET amyloid uh, or PIB. And you can see that in HIV uninfected, uh, HIV infected individuals, there's not an increase in this amyloid. We can also use these same blood-based biomarkers in individuals, and we again see only in those individuals that have Alzheimer's disease do we see these changes. Now, most of these individuals are in their 60s, and so the question is, they should already have accelerated aging. We're not seeing that phenotype of Alzheimer's disease, but it does not mean that at older ages, individuals who are HIV may also develop Alzheimer's disease. But we have now blood tests and imaging ways to kind of separate out, is the cognitive impairment due to HIV or Alzheimer's disease? There are also tau pet markers, and you can see the tau pet is not elevated on the right-hand side, work that Dr. Cooley has done, and that looks different than what you see on the left-hand side, what we see with Alzheimer's disease.
And then finally, Dr. Cooley's also been doing a lot of work on anticholinergics. I'm a very big proponent of deprescribing. And if we can look at that, and I have, I often count how many medications my patients are on, and you can see, and specifically anticholinergics can be very, very important. And so many of these drugs are being given for a lot of different diseases, for COPD, Parkinson's disease, or antiemetics, but they have a significant, cog uh, can significantly affect the cognition, as well as can affect brain volumes. So in summary, when I'm starting to think about these kinds of patients and when they're coming to me, I'm thinking of a multi-hit kind of uh, mechanism that's going on. So there's those social determinants of health of where they've been exposed, the second hit of the seroconversion that's going on, then there's comorbidities, then the fourth hit is then the aging and then interaction with HIV. And so we now need to think about, as our patients are getting older, what is the difference between HIV versus Alzheimer's disease? And we now have that, those abilities to do that, and we need to think about those medications. How can we do that? Using machine learning kinds of ideas to really identify or fingerprint individuals, and so we can see a large mass of different kinds of individuals. We've just been one prescription fits all, and that's probably not the right way. We can collect different kinds of imaging or other kinds of biomarkers to identify these individuals, separate them out, and then identify those subtypes for clinical trials. So I really want to thank the group that I'm so fortunate enough to work with. And we're always looking for new people and follow us on Facebook, Twitter. I don't do all that, but please try to follow us. Thanks so much. the first neurological test, not falling, getting off the stage. <laughs> okay. So you're going to get a very unusual perspective, a neurologist on social functioning and loneliness. Uh, I'll do the best I can. Okay, next slide. I guess, do I have control here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So eight minutes, loneliness and mortality in the general population and then how it associates with HIV specifically, <clears throat> looking at some biological correlates, uh, uh, combined effects of loneliness and inflammation, and finally some interventions. Okay, so this is an overview of systematic reviews, sort of a meta-meta analysis, if you will, uh, of the impact of social isolation uh, and loneliness on a variety of mortality and morbidity factors. And the, the take home message is that there's very consistent uh, evidence that, the, uh, that loneliness has a big impact on cardiovascular disease, mental health incomes, and even uh, all cause mortality. Um, <clears throat> the, the two points that came out of this uh, manuscript that were most salient to me were that prevention strategies need to be developed. There are some treatment strategies that I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes, but prevention strategies need to be developed. And there were no reviews of things like disparities, socioeconomic factors, developmental outcomes. So that's additional work that needs to be done. Relatively little of this has been done in the context of HIV. Uh, I'll give you a sense of, uh, I can't really go into a lot of individual studies, but I'll give you a sense of one way of looking at loneliness. First of all, it's a very hard construct to, to measure, right? Uh, depression is, is going to affect someone's report of loneliness. Chronic pain that impairs mobility is going to affect loneliness and so forth. So this is a study in which Lily Kamalian uh, tried to get a sense of at least the possibility of social interaction by looking at how often people uh, got away from their houses. And uh, so this was done using geolocation services. Uh, 
And <clears throat> the take home message here is that people with HIV, as you might imagine, spend a lot more time at home than people without. And in both of these groups, increasing time spent alone was associated with lower self-reported happiness. Uh, exactly as you might expect, and interestingly, the correlation here was quite similar between people with and without HIV, even though the lines were quite separated. Um, there's been a lot of talk at this meeting about uh, frailty. Uh, people are now talking about social frailty and mental health frailty. And I think all of these things are interrelated and we just need to know more about the ways that things specific to HIV infected infection relate to this whole constellation, uh, and uh, as well as things that are not specifically HIV related. But certainly antiretroviral therapy, uh, inflammation in the context of HIV, and comorbidities are very important. Okay, so here's kind of a conceptual model. This is totally made up by me based on my reading of the literature. Uh, <clears throat> HIV is associated with stigma. This has been, oops, I think we lost our uh, battery or electricity here or something. Um, <clears throat> I must be too electrical. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, you got it. Okay, you got to credit me that 30 seconds. <laughs> so, HIV stigma leading to social isolation and loneliness. Well, there's more to the story. Inflammation, I'm gonna bring that in in a moment. HIV causes, causes chronic inflammation which is well known in the literature independent of HIV to be associated with sick behaviors that take people out of the social milieu and lead to loneliness. I actually had my own personal experience with this yesterday after the COVID vaccine. I didn't want to go to dinner last night because I had chills and I felt uh, all achy all over. And fortunately, 40 seconds left. You didn't credit me the time. <laughs> Pulling in aging and chronic pain, all these interrelated things. I don't think any of these arrows necessarily needs to be pointing in one direction. They, many of them can be bi-directional. Here is the link between inflammation and social isolation. Uh, social isolation is painful. Things that produce pain are often associated with inflammation. And you can see that this relationship between inflammation and uh, social isolation is much stronger in people with HIV than in people without. And last but not least, actually there's a few more slides, um, <laughs> uh, two. Uh, uh, sort of a physiological model. I don't have time to go through this in detail, but there's a lot to think about and investigate here. And you'll notice down the bottom the prominence of inflammation and cytokine production. There are many, many interventional studies that have been done for social isolation uh, and loneliness. They're variably effective. Um, <clears throat> This meta-analysis uh, basically concluded that just a few of them, uh, where there were any effects at all, they were small effects. Uh, but where there were effects, they were with animal therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and sort of multimodal therapy. And interestingly, these are uh, things that were done in long-term care facility people, not in the community. That's what needs to ha happen next. Do it in HIV, do it in, uh, in the community, not in long-term care. Thanks to all my collaborators, to NIMH, and thanks for your attention.
I just couldn't wait to get up here. All right. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. Great to be part of this conference. And this is um, a really fantastic set of talks so far that I think are really raising important issues about, uh, about this area. Um, my funding statement, I don't have any conflicts of interest related to this talk. Um, in my eight minutes, I'm going to um, try to uh, make five points or at least elaborate on a couple of these in more detail, but essentially this is my message. Uh, we know that there's a very high prevalence of depression and overlapping uh, concerns of anxiety, PTSD, substance use, alcohol use, which also overlap with other issues that have been raised, loneliness, social isolation and stigma in people living with HIV. Um, we uh, know that uh, especially depression, which has been most studied, but other mental illnesses lead to worse HIV outcomes, and that uh, integrating treatment for these mental health concerns does improve those HIV outcomes. We know that there's an enormous gap in the provision of appropriate mental health care for people living with HIV. And um, we know what works to uh, close that gap and provide evidence-based treatment that can help to address uh, these negative outcomes that, that we know so much about. So just to unpack a couple of these points in a little bit more detail, this is maybe the, um, I think, the most comprehensive analysis related to the impact of depression on outcomes among people with HIV drawing on nearly 15 years of uh, follow-up from the WISE, women's HIV study funded by NIH, uh, um, met several thousands of women followed for, for several thousands of person years using um, the, the causal inference methods that uh, the HIV field has worked so hard to develop over the past 15 years um, to really highlight a, a, what to me is a, a really startling conclusion, which is that um, the, uh, the effect of depression, of persistent and sustained depression on survival, or to say another way, on, on mortality among people with HIV, is equivalent to the effect of withholding combination ART. So we know that combination ART has revolutionized survival among people with HIV, and there's a similar magnitude of effect waiting to be realized by uh, removing or appropriately treating and addressing depression, removing depression as a, um, a, 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 a progenitor of um, negative HIV outcomes, progression, and mortality. Um, this is because this is another set of analyses that drew, drew on the uh, CIFAR network of integrated clinical systems, a network of um, eight observational cohorts across uh, the U.S. that have all pooled their, their uh, patient cohort data that uh, has demonstrated that, again, using many thousands of patients, many thousands of person years, the more time a patient spends living with depressive symptoms, uh, the more uh, their risk of missing HIV appointments increases, the risk of detectable viral load increases, and the mortality rate increases. So uh, this is what adds up to a negative impact of depression on outcomes in this population. We're all very well familiar with the HIV care cascade. This is the figure that has galvanized the HIV treatment field around reaching 90-90-90 goals of uh, treatment initiation and viral suppression. And we can contrast that with what we know about the penetration of depression care among people living with HIV, the gaps in even screening and identifying depression to begin with, initiating any treatment at all, that treatment being provided actually being something approaching evidence-based or guideline concordant treatment, and therefore the resulting amount of remission achieved through those clinical actions. So this is the gap in screening and treatment that is in place that, uh, that needs to be really overcome to address, address this uh, context. So luckily, we have a number of tools that work. And so the, um, the, the tools that, uh, the evidence-based tools at our disposal to try to address mental health more consistently and uh, um, appropriately within HIV care are pretty well established. We know that integrated care models that bring mental health into the place where people with HIV are already accessing primary health care in their HIV clinic, um, removes major gaps, major barriers to, to access. Um, we know that there are very well-developed models of measurement-based care, which is essentially algorithm-guided antidepressant management that has been shown to uh, provision 
primary health care medical providers or HIV medical providers to provide care of comparable quality to psychiatric specialist management if they have the right decision support in the case of a depression care manager in the clinic who can help them guide that antidepressant treatment, antidepressant management. Collaborative care models also build on that, um, that, that model um, in terms of connecting HIV or other, other um, general care providers with specialist mental health care. Um, there has been a lot of uh, really innovative work in the global mental health field about how do we deliver mental health care in severely resource constrained settings, which um, ha bears uh, some strong parallels to the uh, mental health resources available in many HIV care, uh, HIV care settings, uh, which are similarly you know, stressed environments um, for resources generally, mental health care provision in particular. And so uh, what lessons do we know about how we can train a broader range of healthcare providers, behavioral health providers, social workers, um, even peer navigators to deliver problem-solving therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, transdiagnostic, common elements treatment approach uh, therapies that um, can actually be uh, delivered and have been shown to have comparable effectiveness when being delivered by non-specialists to what we'd observe from uh, more highly skilled um, psychologic, psychologist care uh, delivery individuals. So we have a lot of tools at our disposal uh, in order to achieve integration of um, effective mental health treatment into HIV care. Um, and we also know the importance of the context of trauma, uh, trauma history among people living with HIV, how that affects their engagement with uh, medical care, and the importance of bringing uh, trauma-informed perspectives into um, these medical care approaches. A, um, a comprehensive analysis by uh, CDC's mathematical modeling group that really synthesized about 20 years of research on this topic, uh, concluded that, that was just published earlier this year, uh, concluded that if we were able to integrate these lessons that we already know work and able to widely integrate evidence-based depression treatment models into HIV care across the country, even taking into account that we know that not every patient offered mental health care takes it up. We know that not every patient who starts mental health treatment uh, completes it or you know, achieves full remission. Even taking all of those steps of the cascade into account, that simply that, that widespread integration would lead to a measurable 5% increase in the national viral suppression rate among all people living with HIV. And if we focus just on the people living with HIV with current depression, we would expect to see a 15% increase in the prevalence of national viral suppression um, if we're able to achieve this um, service delivery goal. So just to spend a moment talking about considerations specific to older adults, so in terms of psychosocial counseling, the recommendations don't change, although cognitive changes can lead to challenges in, uh, in patients applying the cognitive tools being offered. We know that for antidepressant medication, the core principle of measurement-based care of start low and go slow remains true because side effects can be slightly more, uh, more pronounced in that population. Uh, we know that depression can produce symptoms that look like dementia, and so in that case, using a medication that is a little bit more stimulating rather than sedating can be helpful. And uh, we know that involving caregivers as individuals age can be uh, e even more important as um, in terms of implementing uh, mental health treatment plans. So just to close, um, in thinking about the way the 90-90-90 and 95-95-95 goals have really galvanized transformations in HIV care around the, the country and the world, what would it take to achieve 90-90-90 in uh, mental health care in terms of integrating systematic screening, treatment initiation, evidence-based uh, depression uh, treatment progression in order to um, achieve remission, improve mental health, and HIV care? So with that, I'd like to thank my uh, funding sources and many collaborators, and thank you for your time.
So I'm going to talk a little bit um, and follow up on these excellent presentations, talk a little bit about um, some work we're doing within the Max Wise study on social connection and isolation through an NIMH-supported R01. Um, we've talked a lot about this today. We've learned in previous presentations that not only do social connections lead to a number of um, health outcomes or associated with them, but they really matter to people. So if we talk about uh, well-being, we need to think about social well-being, physical well-being, um, and all the dimensions. So loneliness and social isolation are painful. They affect quality of life. We know that uh, U.S. adults are increasingly socially isolated and or lonely. I say that because the two constructs are not highly correlated with one another. Actually, they're uh, there's a fairly low correlation in a lot of studies. And I also want to mention that loneliness has two dimensions. Uh, it's discussed in both in terms of an emotional sense of loneliness, that's a sense of strong intimacy with uh, someone or more than one person, and social loneliness, that's a sense of belonging to a group or feeling satisfied with your networks that you belong to. Uh, social isolation increases in older age. There's this idea that loneliness does, but it's not really supported uh, by the literature that we've seen. Uh, we hypothesize and have seen from some of the work that has already been presented that people living with chronic diseases and or stigmatized conditions or identities are going to be at higher risk. And as we've also heard, it's associated with substance use, uh, with depression, with basically a number of other things. Social isolation is uniquely associated with all callers mortality. Um, and we can think about summarizing kind of what is a vast literature on the correlates of social connections. While we often think about it as an intrapersonal thing, um, it is socially and structurally determined, and that's becoming more and more clear as uh, more research is being funded and focused on these issues. And so while things like gender, age, personality, baseline health, uh, uh, genetics, influence loneliness and social isolation and of course interpersonal characteristics and your current life circumstance are associated with those. We know that, and as we've heard about, uh, community level factors, transportation, income inequality, uh, area deprivation, safety of neighborhoods, housing, and social factors, stigma and discrimination, policies, even cultural. Do you live in a uh, more of a communal type of society, which exists in some parts of the world, or are we more pull yourself up kind of a society that can affect things as well. What we don't know and what's been mentioned, one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of interventions uh, in this area is because a lot of studies uh, have not one, measured social isolation and loneliness within the same studies to look at their effects. We know that there are, we postulate there are both independent and synergistic effects. We know that, or we have indications that the chronicity or the extent to which you're experiencing loneliness and social isolation can accumulate. So um, a lot of our, the work is cross-sectional right now. And so we need to look at chronicity, some of the mechanisms described above, um, and really tease out some of the causal directions uh, associated between social isolation, uh, loneliness, and outcomes. And so um, the Max Wise affords an amazing opportunity to address some of the limitations in the literature. There have been um, many cross-sectional studies that have talked about the issues of loneliness and social isolation in HIV, uh, but the Max Wise affords a longitudinal opportunity to do that and a vast platform to look at some of the social, structural, uh, potentially genetic and um, diagnostic factors that may lead us to a better sense of what factors lead to social isolation and loneliness what are the outcomes associated uniquely and in combination with these? And then how can we use that information to design interventions that, are, that have good person fit uh, to advance prevention science in this area? Um, 
the study, uh, we're just going to present a little bit of uh, cross-sectional data. That's all we have right now since we're at the start of the study. Um, but this project is embedded within five sites of the Max Wise and also capitalizes among the Ys on at least six, eight years of um, measures of loneliness. We are embedding a detailed uh, survey on social isolation, emotional and social loneliness at five Max Wise sites. We're working closely with a community advisory group who is providing amazing guidance to us and help, has helped us develop a set of qualitative interviews that are also being um, embedded twice, uh, so paired qualitative interviews in the study. And then we're going to link it within this vast social ecological uh, resource available in the MaxWise. What I wanted to show you, first of all, uh, we finished the first wave of this data collection and uh, using um, um, the berkman symes Social Network Index, a very well-established index of social isolation. And what we found among persons living with HIV participating in this study is that 37% of them are socially isolated, meaning that they are having almost zero or not many at all social interactions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a lot of these differences um, are by gender, so who is socially isolated. These are the four factors that comprise social isolation, and you can see that there's differences in who participates in what types of activities or interactions that can form, inform interventions. Also, in the cohort, we found that about um, 28% are socially isolated of that um, larger group, but 9% are both socially isolated and lonely, and 12% are categorized as on lonely only and not socially isolated. And if you look by age, what you can see is um, somewhat good news aligned with the research that uh, loneliness doesn't get worse in older age. Um, uh, it actually improves a little bit. So that's kind of good news, but still an enormous burden. If you look at associations with medication adherence and quality of life, these are just unadjusted. What you can see is that social isolation is associated with some aspects of quality of life. We are not seeing it with adherence. Emotional loneliness and social loneliness are robustly associated with indices of quality of life. And in terms of uh, the last few presentation, if we look at the burden of depression sy symptoms, both through a CESD cutoff and through a diagnostic instrument we're implementing in Max Wise, model one, it, it's social support does not account for relationships. So uh, model one is unadjusted associations with higher burden of depression symptoms. Model two accounts for all of these social support, social connection variables. And then model three is age, gender, um, alcohol use disorder, substance use, and um, smoking, I believe. So uh, what you can see here is that emotional loneliness is really driving the relationships that we've seen. So uh, this leads us closer to trying to identify some of these relationships. Um, that's about it. This is our model of what we'll be studying over the next several years. And I want to thank my study team and NIMH for their support in this work. Yeah, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, and we will start some, with some question and answers, I suppose. So if anybody in the audience has any questions. I just failed my neurologic test. <laughs> so Joe Margulik from Johns Hopkins. This is a question for maybe Dr. Pence, but maybe others. So there are different types and degrees of depression. 
Are they related to who among your depressed people is successful in achieving virologic suppression? And related question is, if someone who is in the depressed category does achieve virologic suppression, is their mortality still different from people who are not depressed? Yeah, th thanks for the question. So certainly uh, depression comes in a lot of flavors and levels of severity and sort of broadly speaking, the more severe the depression, the bigger the challenge it poses. Um, more than just, I would say, probably the severity of the depression in HIV, um, there is um, commonly the overlapping concerns of is there comorbid anxiety, comorbid PTSD, comorbid substance use that also tend to have a an additive effect to the barriers patients face or people living with HIV face in um, remaining engaged in care and achieving clinical outcomes. So I said yes, say yes, severity is certainly related to outcomes as we see that kind of persistence is related to outcomes. Um, if you control for viral suppression, is depression still independently predictive of mortality? Uh, I think the answer is yes. So viral suppression is one component of, um, you know, of achieving sustained engagement in care, but there are so many other behavioral components as well and biological components to, to long-term health that it's certainly a, a critical pathway for HIV care, but there's so many multifactorial influences on that, that health stream that, so yes, even controlling for viral suppression, there would still be an impact of depression on, on mortality. I don't know if other panelists wanted to weigh in. I was interested in your thoughts on specifically the apathy component of depression and viral suppression. Um, yes, as a as a pathway, so depression, we have the you know low mood and the anhedonia components, and um, they. Uh, the apathy is, component is one that relates certainly to ability to engage in care. Um, so that would, that would certainly be part of the pathway. I don't think, is this on? Hi, thank you for a um, really fascinating series of talks. Um, I um, had a question uh, for Bo. Um, I was curious, um, in your neuroimaging findings, um, you reported on a series of factors that are linked to accelerated brain aging, um, including area deprivation index. Um, and of course, um, though a lot of these factors we know are you know highly collinear with HIV, so childhood trauma is going to be strongly associated with the neighborhood you live in, which is going to be associated with your likelihood of HIV. Um, and so we, you know, end up with a bit of a Gordian knot in terms of attributing causality um, and what factors are actually driving uh, the neurological changes that we see. Um, and then in addition, we know that, especially with brain aging, these trajectories are starting very early in life. So Kolich and um, Ketting and Haringa and others have shown that, you know, very early on we can see changes in the way in which the brain is developing and aging as a function, for instance, of childhood trauma exposure. But I think it's really exciting that with um, the findings you were describing um, that link the, um, I believe it was the timing of achieving um, viral suppression and uh, or initiation of um, ART that you can you know then link that to um, the subsequent uh, effects on brain structure. So my question is, have you um, had the opportunity within those data where you can potentially separate out the effects of the HIV infection, the duration of the infection? Um, from some of these other factors that are so collinear, if you've had the opportunity to do that, and just if you could comment on, on what you've seen in that regard. Yeah, so that's a great question, and I think it gets even more complicated. So um, you're absolutely right. So we need to actually, and what you're, you're talking about, is get a full, but it takes a long time, detailed history of their exposures from 
birth onward. And there are things that we're looking, and I know Sarah's been doing some of this stuff of early life stressors, so childhood trauma, other kinds of factors that are very, very important. They definitely have an impact on the brain and set up a substrate for then subsequent other changes that could be occurring. I will also tell you that the ADI is only a reflection of where you are at that time. And so it's also important to just as much look at where they were. So you may be, because you're a college student in not as good an area, but you grew up in a different area or vice versa, but dependent upon when you came in and what you used as your address is different. And so it's that lived experiences, what you're going for and what you're asking about is extremely important. And I think that starts the substrate. And so have we been able to tease that out? No, we need to do more work on that. And I think that's where getting individuals and talking to them and also ask, asking them those questions. Now it's a tough thing to do because it can then bring back certain of those traumas or those other kinds of things. So it has to be done in a delicate way. And then it also takes a lot of time to do that kind of stuff. So it may be in a multi-interview kind of step process, but I think you're absolutely right. It's not just what you are at this instant, but it's everything else, your past, as well as what you are now. I don't know if I answered your question. All right, number three. Okay, Michael Donovan with Possibility San Diego. You guys have all talked about uh, a lot of factors that affect the mental health of individuals and people living with HIV. Um, to what degree have you seen, um, as you knock off some of the, the issues, as you begin to treat depression, as you begin to provide more social interaction, as you begin to take uh, control of the HIV, have you seen improvements in mental health that are repeatable? I guess what I'm really looking for is there residual damage that, it, that once done can't be undone. I can take a stab at that and Bo may have been about to say the thing, same thing, which is that there's a very strong legacy effect. If you were lived in the area before good antiretroviral therapy and you had a high viral load and a low CD4 count for a long time, there's unfortunately some unrecoverable damage. Is that what you mean? Yep, and we can show that by imaging or a number of ways that there's a hit. You took a hit and that the idea is, is that if you're started earlier on antiretrovirals, there is definitely, and we can show that in a number of different ways, starting early and well controlled definitely makes a difference. But you also saw even in today with Christine talking about even exercise or other things where there's that mental, you know, that runner's high that we get from doing those kinds of things. There are other ways they will bring you up. And what we're trying to do is how do we get you almost back to that level? And are there other ways? And then what you also heard from Dr. Greenwood, which is very important, I don't think we're doing enough of this, is looking at those resilience. So who are those people who are doing so well and doing living well and aging well? What are those factors? And that's actually been something that we're very interested. Maybe a little bit of the genetics, but it's probably a number of other factors uh, that they're engaging in that are very, very important. So how do we identify those so that then that can be translated to others? Okay, there are a couple of questions online and then we will get back. Um, so Norm, Norm Havi from Hopkins says, uh, this question is for either Ron or Bo. Uh, where are we with the mechanisms for accelerated aging with HIV? Can we definitely conclude that there is an accelerated aging phenotype in people with HIV? Uh, and is there evidence for continual downward progression uh, once the impairment is apparent? <laughs> Ready to go for it? Uh, three, three questions is always a <laughs> problem. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Norm. Uh, uh, I'll find you later. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, I think what we're, uh, uh, what I was showing you, and I think that you can see that 
There is, sorry to say, as we're sitting in this room, there is an aging process that's going on. So there will be changes in our brains that are going on. In those individuals that are not virologically well controlled, there is that added hit or added continued because of the virus and inflammation and other factors that are going on. That doesn't say that there isn't already low-level chronic inflammation that could be also leading to some of the changes that are present, but specifically in those individuals who are not well controlled, that is another factor. And so adherence is important. I didn't, Vasu, get all the other questions. I, I'm sorry. Was there? So about the aging phenotype, uh, accelerated aging phenotype and... Right. So, so that was what Kalen was looking at. And it's just not just the um, virus itself. It's, it's other viruses, so hepatitis C, and then there are other comorbidities that are contributing. So as we're getting older, we're acquiring, and we saw that and even in the earlier in the day, there are additional comorbidities in the 80-year-old clinics we were seeing from different places that there were additional comorbidities, so hypertension, diabetes, small vessel diseases occurring. So there's another kind of, I would say, almost hits that are going on in those individuals that is also uh, affecting those individuals. And it could be partially due to the virus, but it could also be due to older age. We have more of these uh, comorbidities that are present. Thank you. We'll take a couple questions from the room. Hi. Um, so many questions, so little time. So a focused question to Dr. Ansis, to Dr. Ellis. Do we have any uh, beginnings of hard data on how chronic inflammation in people who are well controlled, how that may affect uh, clinical manifestations, both um, structurally and clinically. Um, I can just say that uh, even when you control the virus, when you do, as you know, a lot of inflammatory markers partially or completely normalize, which is wonderful but they don't totally normalize. And that's true even for people who are long-term um, uh, suppressors, who, who never had much virus to begin with. And does it impact outcomes? Well, there's some degree of premature or accelerated aging, even in those long-term suppressors or non-progressors, I should say. And then, uh, yeah, uh, you know, all of the comorbidities, our clinical outcomes, basically diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and many other things, neurocognitive impairment, all are impacted by chronic inflammation. Okay, one more. Uh, hi, um, Bruce Hirsch from New York. Where is the concept of neuronal plasticity. You couldn't go two feet 10 years ago without hitting that concept. And I think our, our concept of care is not intensive enough. People with intensive effort have remarkable improvements, and they're in our practice. We have people who are well controlled for decades who are performing at very, very high levels. And I think part of it is personal habits of, I, I was gonna say, intellectual hygiene, of applying effort, of focusing and, and uh, working at cognitive tasks over and over again. And I think that there's a biology behind this that we're overlooking in our, our uh, discussion about this uh, somewhat depressing t uh, topic of well-controlled people um, uh, deteriorating. I think that there's, uh, in our practices, we're seeing clinical examples of remarkable success. I can just reinforce that point by saying we just did this large biopsychosocial phenotype study using machine learning and so on and so forth to generate phenotypes. The largest phenotype was the healthy across all domains phenotype. Amen. I think that's a really positive message to be sending our patients. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Manoj from uh, National Coalition of People Living with HIV in India. I, I don't have a question, I just want to continue the discussion which is going on, like what is working well? 
So I am living with HIV since last 31 years. And um, because of Ifavirin, gone for depression phase and then um, just because of uh, healthy lifestyle and um, as you said, like mental hygiene. And I like that terms. <laughs> so uh, now, like just because of uh, a positive thinking, it's a, it's a whole package of like doing physical exercise, positive thinking. Whenever I'm taking, uh, taking my pill, I'm just thinking that today I'm killing 10 trillion violence, uh, virus. Any medication I'm taking, I'm thinking that, okay, it's working on me. So these are small, small things which is actually working. Uh, when I was in depression, there was a, a skin infections like eczema. Now it's surprise, maybe researchers can think like the entire eczema is gone. There is no, no skin infection at all. So these are the things like the yoga, meditation, and uh, all physical exercises. Like, and that's that is that's all we are working, and it's a package of uh, like the whole healthy lifestyle and something that is maybe we can. You said like, what is working well that needs to also study, and that might be the uh, we can think in a positive way. Thank you. Yeah, we will have one question online in, then come to you, Ben. Um, so. I think Bo is popular today. So, uh, Dr. Ansis, are this is from Jules. Uh, are younger PWH, say for example, in their 40s, uh, at risk for future cognitive impairment? And uh, can you explain why or why not? I, I'm, I'm at risk for cognitive impairment. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, yes. So, I mean, all of us are at risk. Um, and uh, I think the number one risk factor is age. So if you were going to ask me, you know, like, so a lot of people ask, like, Alzheimer's disease, what's the number one risk factor? It's actually age. So as we get older, we're all at risk for developing cognitive impairment. At a 40-year-old, if they're well controlled, the, if they're doing well, there's great opportunities for those individuals. And as you're already hearing in a number of different instances, I think we should be celebrating and, and looking at that. Um, so there are many possibilities for, for all of us. Um, but as we get older, you know, if we get into our 70s and our 80s, the risk of Alzheimer's disease is, is going to be facing all of us. And it used to be, you know, with HIV, that wasn't being even considered. But now... This is something that's going to be facing our older community and needs to be thought about. So I would say, you know, at 40, uh, do the stuff you want to do, be healthy lifestyle, do those kinds of things. At 60s and 70s, and especially in the 80s, that's when you got to be thinking about that. And just as a plug, and I've talked to this about Jules too, none of the current studies that have been used for anti-amyloid anti therapies have included uh, persons living with HIV. So there is still an important work that needs to be done and understood in that. There are now two therapies that are approved and there's going to be a third in the next three months that will be probably approved for Alzheimer's disease. So yes, that's something we'll be all facing, all of us in this room, regardless of our status. Okay, we have one question, last one question, and we will conclude after that. Oh, that's me. Oh, thank you. Um, you actually answered one of my questions. As a woman diagnosed with HIV, I am Linda Scruggs. I'm the co-executive director of Ribbon, the Center of Excellence, right in Largo, Maryland. Thank you, because I was going to ask, how many of these studies actually include persons like me, the baby boomers of HIV? As many of you know, we're the largest generation of persons living with HIV, and we will be forever the largest generation, and often many of the data and cohorts are absent of us in the work that we're doing, so that's one piece. The other piece is the advocate and um, the co-ED of this center where we're providing education training, and I, I wish I could, I'll, I'll see you later, the gentleman who talked about the models of utilizing community health workers and allied, allied health spaces. The conversation we're having in mental health is a conversation where we're trying to teach peers in allied health. And we sit in these rooms often like overwhelmed because I'm overwhelmed that I need a piece of chocolate right now to keep up with what's happening. And there's not a piece of chocolate in this building. Um, <clears throat> 
But how do we get the translation of this language into the hands of the individuals who are making the difference, right? So I know I spend a lot of time reading articles trying to figure out how to translate this research and this work into usable hands at the collective masses because it's not enough for our clinicians to do in the small time that our health insurance agencies give them to speak with their clients. So I really constantly push um, our researchers, our clinicians, I need you to write outside of your journal spaces. We have to get researchers to write in a way that community can use this information. The number of me how heavy mental health is, particularly when we're talking about marginalized, underserved communities globally, globally, we need this mental health conversation. And that's a global underserved community. Globally, it's underserved, it's underfunded, it's under research. So there's this desperate hunger to be able to translate and get this information in an intelligent way, in a translatable way to ally health professionals. So I really um, like pleading, like help us get this in the hands because they're the influencers, they're the change agents that go to their peers, them themselves, whether in substance abuse, whether in mental health, um, um, cognitive space, like us mental um, hygienists ourselves who are doing well in that space, um, that's important. But again, as the baby boomers, it's unacceptable at this point in HIV that we're not part of and we are available and there are places where we can give you access to community who's willing to do and be part of the research that's happening here. Thank you for that. Okay. Once again, on uh, behalf of NIMH and OAR, we would like to thank the speakers and the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you.